Oh, it's snowing sideways outside. Good thing we have a nice warm shop to hide in, right? Welcome back to the channel, everybody. Another installment of the 1113 series, and we have a lot to cover today, so we're gonna jump right into it. I've given 1113's case an initial cleaning. This is by no means as clean as it is going to get, but it received a pretty good once over, and it's a vast improvement over what it was. We can at least look at it now without getting all that nasty grease all over us. I've also got all of the contents from the transmission cleaned up. We've assessed condition, came to some rather horrifying conclusions. Well, we'll address that later, but we're gonna start off with the last few pieces that either need to come out of 1113's case or could. So the first one I'm gonna look at is this bearing race, pardon my shadow, way at the bottom, way down here. That's for the back bearing on the counter shaft. I'm not sure if I'm gonna to have to pull that out of 1113's case yet, but since I have old 2115's case just about finished in here, and it's kicked up anyway because we gotta do part of that job from the bottom, we'll take that race out of this one, at least for demonstration purposes. We'll go to the parts manual diagram to give you an idea what we're gonna do. So here's the race right here, surrounds that bearing. Here's the bottom of the case, and you can see they have a cup plug with a dowel pin that retains and aligns that bearing race, locates it in the case, and helps to ensure that it's not going to spin. So, to remove that race, you need to remove the dowel, and you need to remove that cup. So, this should be where that cup is, down inside that hole right there. First task is get rid of that. Normally, I just drill those things out because they're not that hard to replace. That should be about a 3 8 cup plug in there. I'm starting out with a 23 64 bit, just a notch under 3 8 because I don't want to make the hole in the case any bigger. We're just trying to get the shoulder off of that plug so we can peel it out. Okay, we got it coming out of there now. Another little trick I'll use is once I get, you can see most of the shoulders off of there. I'll take a small punch and I'll pop a hole in the center of it and then that kind of allows you to get in there and, and dig it out. So that was step number one. Now if the last person that put this dowel in positioned it correctly, the exposed end should be threaded for a 10 by 32 bolt or machine screw. Yep, and they did. Fortunately, it's in there properly so we can run this in, grab a hold of the dowel and at least have something to try and pull it out with. If they would have put it in backwards, you don't have the convenience of having those threads out there and your day just got a little more complicated. There we got it. All right, good deal. With the retaining dowel out, we're now clear to drift the race out of the case. Weather conditions are expected until midnight Central Standard Time tonight. The following impacts are expected plan on slippery road conditions. Widespread blowing snow could significantly reduce visibility. The hazardous conditions could impact the evening commute. Strong winds could cause tree damage. The cold wind chills as low as 25 below zero could cause frostbite on exposed skin in as little as 30 minutes. Well, I hope the heater doesn't quit. And that's how you would remove that bearing race that's way down here. Like I said, I, I may still pull that out of 1113. I'm not sure yet, but 2115 was just so much more convenient to show you how to do that, at least for a demonstration. So. I do have to pull both of these steering clutch actuator levers out of 1113's case though. And you can see this one moves freely. This one is a little bit locked up. So these two points here and here are probably the most neglected on a CAT D2 as far as lubrication goes because there is no way to really, really lubricate either one of those pivots very well. There is a needle bearing inside there and the actuator, the bearing are both retained by this press fit pin and this press fit pin. And usually these are very dry because they've never received anything. So we'll get these two pins pulled out or we'll try. Then I'll show you how that goes. 
So these pins are threaded on the inside. They take a fine thread 3 8 bolt. I made a tool out of this one. You can see I threaded it almost all the way to the head. I threw a nut and a couple washers on there and I'll use it as a puller in conjunction with a socket. So we'll just run that in as far as it will go. And as I run the nut down the bolt, it will force the bolt and the pin up into the socket, pulling both out of the case. Boy, this one's being a pretty stubborn pull. Usually the socket's enough to do it, but I had to, basically well, I ran out of threads and I had to put a spacer under it to try and get some more lift. So 1113 is being a little stubborn, but it feels like it's just about ready to pull the rest of the way out. Oh, it's getting pretty easy. Oops. There, I think we got it. Yep, there it is. Honestly, that shaft looks pretty good. So with that out of the way, we can pull that actuator out. See the bearing inside it. A needle bearing, and honestly that needle bearing doesn't look bad either. So maybe we lucked out, and we have one side anyway that's in good shape. So that's how they go together in the case, just like that. Now we work on this rusty one over here. Oh, you heard snap. That means it is moving. Same as the other side, I had to get that adapter put in. There we go. Take the tool off and assess here real quick. I noticed I got a little bit harder of a pull once we get in there. You can see where the needles have been rusting on the shaft a little bit. That's not yeah, some rust coming out of there. It's not awesome, but let's take that actuator out, see what we're up against. Okay, I'll tell you it's already worse than the other side. And it looks like the bearing is stuck in there, so we'll put this to soaking, see if we can end up salvaging any of that. But that concludes the disassembly that I needed to do on 1113's case. So we can proceed with final cleaning on this now. Okay, now that we're done with that, we can move on to the parts that are on the bench behind me. But before we get to the assessment phase, a little bit more housekeeping to do. Over the last two videos of transmission disassembly, I've had two or three people in the comment section ask if I could do a description of the power flow through the gear sets once those pieces were cleaned up a little bit and we could see things a little better. So I'll do the best I can. So we got it all laid out on the bench here. So best way to think of it is we have three separate shafts. Roll these apart a little bit. We have the input shaft. The input shaft is not connected to the pinion shaft. It just rolls on that bearing that's up in the front of it there. So shaft number one is the input shaft. Shaft number two is the counter shaft. Shaft number three then would be the pinion shaft. But the way these are positioned in the transmission, these front two gears are in constant mesh. So the input shaft is always driving the counter shaft. When you shift gears, you are basically shifting the gears that are on the pinion shaft into mesh with the counter shaft to get your different speeds. So the position we're in right now is neutral because this gear, these gears, and that gear are not meshing with anything on the counter shaft. So the counter shaft is just spinning happily away down there. Nothing's going on, pinion shaft is not moving at all. But if you shift it into first, that slides this gear backwards puts it in mesh with the smaller gear. So you have power flow coming through the input shaft into the counter shaft here. The small gear drives this large gear, which turns the pinion shaft at first gear speed. So I've disengaged first gear, we're back in neutral again. When you shift into second, that moves the back gear back here on the pinion shaft. We go backwards and now we mesh with this gear here. So now our power flow comes through the input into the counter shaft 
runs up the counter shaft, is transmitted to the pinion shaft through this gear, that spins it at second gear speed. And now we're back to neutral. So for third gear, this middle gear set moves back and we mesh this gear with this one. So power flow now is input shaft to counter shaft. It runs down the counter shaft. It's transmitted to the pinion shaft through this gear. You get third gear speed. Now we're back to neutral. So to hit fourth gear, we go ahead. Now we mesh this gear with this gear. So we have input shaft to counter shaft, back to pinion shaft, and then you have fourth gear. Now we're back to neutral. Fifth gear now is kind of like my Farm All H. We basically bypass the counter shaft and turn it direct drive straight down the pinion shaft. So this whole time we've had the input shaft just spinning away, not connected to the pinion shaft. Well, this gear slides forward and meshes with some internal teeth to the external teeth of the input gear. And we've basically locked the pinion shaft in direct drive to the same revolutions per minute that engine speed is. So like I said, just like my Farm All H, we basically bypass the counter shaft. It's still spinning away down here because we're still in constant mesh here to here. None of these other gears are meshing with it. So basically it's just spinning, doing nothing and power flow is straight back to the bevel gear. But in a Caterpillar D2, I've never needed fifth gear. <laughs> and for reverse, well, we have the reverse idler has to come into play. I've had him just laying back here because there's no good way to make him float in midair. But the reverse idler gear is always in mesh with this gear on the counter shaft. That sits there and spins all the time. So for reverse, the old second sliding gear slides forward and it meshes with the idler gear, but it cannot mesh with the gear on the counter shaft. So your power flow is input shaft to counter shaft, counter shaft to reverse idler, reverse idler to pinion shaft, and that spins it backwards. So that's reverse. Hopefully that's not too confusing. That's how it works. And one final classroom topic as long as we are on transmission gears. One Mr. Luke Strasser under the last video asked if I could explain the difference between the SP higher speed third and fourth gear that 2115 had in it versus the standard speed gears that 1113 has. So we'll look at, I've got 2115's old engine tag here. You can see 5J2115 SP stamped at the back. That stands for special parts. And those were typically pieces buried deep inside the machine that required special attention to be paid to the unit as it was going down the assembly line. In 2115's case, she had the higher speed third and fourth gears found quite often in agricultural units, drawbar tractors that needed a little higher ground speed to do the work that they were being purchased to do. So it's a super simple conversion too. I didn't even bother cleaning the gears out of 2115 to have them here on the bench because it's, it's all in the books. So you have third and third, fourth and fourth. So it's this little paired gear set here and this little paired gear set here. The only thing you had to do to convert was, here's the parts manual, special third and fourth gear group, boom, boom. So to do a conversion, if you had the SP gears and you wanted to, you just slide the standard one off, put the SP version on in its place. Then its corresponding standard gear goes off, the corresponding SP gear goes on. You just retrofitted and made it a hot rod D2, if you will. Pinion shaft, bevel gear, all other parts are exactly the same. It's just a slightly different tooth count on this gear set and that gear set that spins the pinion shaft a little bit faster. So as long as we're talking about the speeds, I listed the transmission speeds standard versus the SP just for curiosity's sake. First is 1.7 mile per hour. Second is 2.5. Standard third is three. Standard fourth is 3.6. Fifth gear is 5.1 with a 2.1 mile per hour reverse. But the SP gears basically take the old fourth and make it the new third. So the SP gears, third is now 3.6, and then it bumps fourth up to 4.2. So it's not that much of a difference, but when you're looking at towing different implements, ground-driven stuff, or just playing cover and ground faster, it can make a lot of difference at the end of the day. And I have no real need, no real want to convert 1113 to a hot rod. I'm gonna keep the SP gear set for something, I don't know, but me personally and my needs with old crawlers, I don't need a lot of ground speed. Ground speed 
increases wear on undercarriage it, or in, increases stress being applied to all the drivetrain components and most of the times when I'm dozing I'm either first in reverse or second in reverse and if I'm in the field I usually hit third gear and that's about it. I put 2115 in fourth gear one time and I thought the fenders were going to fall off. I mean, uh, looking back, that was a pretty loose machine, so it was, it was probably a lot more dramatic than it really was, but I've never had the Iron Mistress, my 5U7066. She's never been in fourth or fifth. I don't know that I'd ever try fifth in a, in a D2 cat. I don't know, but we're keeping 1113 standard. So, Luke, I hope that answers your question. Very simple changeover. Really just those two gear sets and you're ready to go. All right, everybody. Finally, the assessment phase of the gear train for 1113. Probably what you guys have been waiting for this whole time. Well, we'll just cut right to it. After I got everything cleaned up, well, I noticed we have some rust pitting on the first gear here on the counter shaft. And we have a little bit of rust pitting going on on the constant mesh gear at the front of the counter shaft. Everything else... Wear wise really wasn't bad until I got to the fourth gear this one and this one You can see We got some some light variations kind of some lines that go across that's because we have a divot about right here And we have a high spot about right here, and then we have some more wear on the leading edge And then on the counter shaft if we can pick it up with the GoPro We've actually got some brindling happening on the drive faces of those gears. Brenneling is when little pieces of metal are actually starting to flake off. Usually happens on gears that have been in mesh for a long, long time. So, well, I looked a little deeper after that. So with all three gear sets off the counter shaft, we notice all of a sudden on the splines, starting right here, there is profound wear and it ends right here. That is the area directly beneath the three, four gear set. And the heaviest spline wear is at the front up here, underneath the fourth speed gear. So that tells me 1113 spent a lot of time in fourth gear. Maybe some time in third, not so much <laughs> in any of the other gears but on each end. But boy, that fourth gear really shows it. So that pretty much proves 1113 has been a drawbar tractor its whole life. It never had a blade on it, no indications of blade mounts, anything like that. The pinhole and drawbar is getting a little bit egg shaped, but that thing got put in fourth gear and it stayed there probably for half the day until it was lunchtime. And then after lunchtime, it was back into fourth gear probably till dark or a little bit after. So that proves without a doubt 1113 was an agricultural cat. Probably did a lot of things like, you know, light tillage, like disking, maybe planting, stuff like that to have that high of a ground speed for that many hours. Well, that's it's kind of given us a glimpse of the history on the machine. Kind of interesting, I think. So we know we have a transmission with some heavy fourth gear wear. Probably not going to be an issue for me. I don't ever get that high anyway, but we need to be conscious that that's there. Let's get into the bevel gear and the pinion. Well, we'll look at the cross shaft first. We have the right side bearing. You can see we're getting some rust pits on the rollers. Left side bearing, actually a little bit worse, I'd say. Left side bearing race, not good, but not bad. Right side bearing race, however, up here by my thumb, we've got more of that brindling going on. It's starting to shell small little flecks off the face. So that explains the slight in play we had on that shaft. The bearings have collapsed a little bit. At minimum, we need new bearings and races on that shaft because it's so much work to get back into that thing. You do that job right the first time every time. Okay, without fail. Looking at the pinion gear, there is a lot of pitting there. A lot of scarring there, a lot of scarring there. We look at the bevel gear. We get around here, these are the drive side faces of the teeth. We have lots of pitting here. We have a hole pretty much out of that one there. Not much better there, not much better there. The problem with pitting on gear teeth is you lose tooth to tooth contact area, okay? There's been some conjecture in the comment section back and forth as to whether or not you can get away with pitting, minor pitting on gear teeth. And to an extent, yes. So here's where I'm at with 1113. In all reality, if I run this about the same that I run all my other old tractors, it's we're probably looking at it's maybe going to see another 100 hours of use from here on out, at least with me as the owner. Maybe a little bit more if I really like it. But 
Would these gear teeth that I have here go another 100 hours? Yes. And that's not a tentative yes, that's an absolutely yes. Those would last another 100 hours and they would not give me a problem. That being said, well, I have that nagging voice in the back of my head that says, you know, you still have this